Well, um, I uh, have spent my entire life in New Brunswick. Uh, I was born in 1952 uh, and uh, lived um, in the Schwartz Homes section of New Brunswick for the first couple of years of my life. I moved to Handy Street um, near the corner of, at the time, it was Codwise Avenue, now Joyce Kilmer Avenue. Um, mm -hmm. We stayed there for you know, 20 some years until I got through college and lived for a short period of time on Juliet Street, then Raritan Gardens, an apartment complex off of Route 18, uh, until uh, my wife and I bought our home in the Rutgers Village section of New Brunswick in 1978. And that's where we are today. Um, grew up in the city. Uh, the, uh, have a uh, good back, uh, background wise elementary school and high school is both at St. Peter's uh, here in New Brunswick. Um, uh, higher education, two years in Middlesex County College, uh, two years at uh, then Glassboro, now Rowan University. Uh, I have a master's degree in criminal justice from Rutgers University and have my Jewish doctor in, uh, from Seton Hall. Uh, work wise, uh, the, uh, clerk for the then presiding. It's a, well, actually, I went to my graduate work was all done. Uh, so in '74, when I graduated from Glassboro, I worked in the uh, Middlesex County Court Administrator's Office. Responsibilities included oversight of the court system, etc. Um, smaller role, I, mean, I didn't have the actual principal oversight responsibilities. Was a part of the team. I uh, clerked for uh, Judge Morris, who was the uh, then presiding judge of the uh, criminal courts here in Middlesex County. Uh, became a, an assistant city attorney in 1980 uh, in, in, in New Brunswick, um, appointed by uh, Mayor Lynch at the time, and uh, went into the private sector practice of law with Bill Hamilton, which may be mm -hmm. that's familiar with his firm. Um, worked with Bill for five years in the private sector while maintaining a, a role as an assistant city attorney. and. Um, then went out into my own um, practice for a year and then formed a partnership with a fellow named Robert Doshio. Um, and then formed the, it's basically the beginnings of my current firm. We've gone through one or two different partners, but um, in 90 um, was a part of Cahill Branch, uh, Highland and Branch of Fort now, Cahill, Branch of Fort, and Hobish. That's it. married to two kids, two adult kids. Um, and you ran for mayor and Ran for mayor in 1991, uh, 90, and uh, took office in 91. Had you been on the town council? No, city no council? prior uh, okay. in-service uh, elected office. You know, from that history, I can, I can imagine when you started becoming involved or have some connection to the city's redevelopment, but maybe okay. if you could kind of tell us. Uh, well, it, it, it probably would have really started um, in, um, when I became an assistant city attorney. Um, prior to that, in 1977, I got married. Um, my wife and I bought our home, as I said, in 78. Um, so we made a commitment to the project. This is where we were going to, uh, where I was going to keep my roots and my wife was going to join me. Uh, and the project was going to be our home. And as a result of that, I look to get involved now as a, just having passed the New Jersey bar. Um, and so I was given an opportunity by Mayor Lynch to, to be directly involved as an assistant city attorney. Through that process, in the 10 years that I served in that capacity, was not only very much involved in uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the city from a legal perspective and working at all with the different uh, Departments, uh, etc., but was very much engaged in the revitalization component mm -hmm. uh, of it, and um, got to see firsthand how government um, can make things happen if it, if it has the and, and what were some of those like early projects, and if you can take us forward that you were well, the the the, the earliest of them include like the Farron Deck, um, where there was actually to show you the struggles that a municipality might be going through. The whole idea at that point in time was to get people to uh, park here next to the train station and hopefully buy a cup of coffee. Uh, and we 
to catch them on the way to someplace else. Now the theory behind it is, you know, we are the destination. Uh, while we certainly understand the commuter mentality, and that people who you know, might be working in New York or Philadelphia might be close to the train station, so they hop on it. By the same token, people are taking the train here. Mm -hmm. um, so was that a you there? I don't recall. Uh, I don't recall. Um, you know, J and J obviously was a part of the initial revitalization, uh, the Golden Triangle uh, that was across to, uh, from the, adjacent to the train station, 120 Albany Street. Homer Square, those were all the, the uh, projects that um, uh, the, the Lynch administration had shepherded through and, and, and I think did a remarkable job. Now, I can imagine why these redevelopment projects were being uh, implemented, but if, if you can you give us your perspective? I mean, well, there, it, you know, a, a city has, I guess, a couple of choices. You can you can choose to be what you are and do nothing about it, mm -hmm. uh, or you can choose to become something different. Um, and if you if you do nothing, one thing you'll you'll definitely guarantee is that you'll you'll slide in the wrong direction. Um, the city's ever changing, particularly a city like New Brunswick, um, and so growth um, becomes critically important. And it doesn't necessarily mean growth in numbers of people or growth in size of structures, but growth in a sense of energy, enthusiasm, and a sense of uh, um, a place to be, you know, a place that people are, 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 are proud to be and comfortable to be, either to live or to work uh, or, or, or to have leisure time activities. Um, how much was public finance a, you know, the, the Communities in New Jersey are just so reliant on local resources. Was that? Well, I think it's a combination. It depends upon. Uh, I mean, a lot of the, as you know from your, your 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 research, you know, New Brunswick was among the leaders in the taking advantage of the urban development action grants. Great program. Um, you know, you 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 first get money uh, from uh, the the federal government. It's a loan. Uh, the developer actually gets it. The developer is then required to repay the loan to the municipality, and then in turn the municipality is required to reinvest that money uh, into other items that uh, help the economic wherewithal of the, of the development of the city. So you get to recycle the dollars twice. I mean, it, quite frankly, it doesn't get much better right. than that. So. Um, you know, those, the, the advantage of those UDAC funds have benefited the city for a number of years. Now, obviously, programs have gone by the wayside, um, and we no longer have the advantage of that. But they helped us maintain a momentum in difficult times. So those types of subsidies, because it is more difficult to, um, uh, to develop in urban centers. Um, there's not virgin land. There are costs of demolition. There, there is a greater likelihood, although not always, uh, of uh, environmental concerns. So uh, those things in and of itself take uh, more energy, more time, and, and more money to complete something. So anytime there is um, alternate sources of income that's going to entice a, a developer um, to spend their money uh, here and help them, uh, it's, it's, it's helpful. And it doesn't matter whether it's a business proposition or a residential or somebody's even building a home. Um, you know, whatever it is, you know, alternate sources of revenues are always helpful. Mm -hmm. A number of people have mentioned uh, one of the themes of the redevelopment was the public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little about your sense of that? And well, it's um, how it came about and how it developed. Well, I actually started well before my time, and I was really the uh, uh, the vision of those first involved in the revitalization mode to recognize that the uh, private sector couldn't do it alone, that the government sector couldn't do it alone, and that the, the civic area couldn't do it alone. So, um, so the pooling of energies and resources, creating as best you can a commonality of, of vision and thought, um, an establishment of goals of where we need to get to, um, was critically important to the city then. And very frankly, is critically important to us today. And 
I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we perhaps have been more successful than most uh, in getting things done. And, and your perspective on the role of New Brunswick tomorrow and DEFCO in this partnership? Um, well, it's a, it was a great idea then and it continues to be a great idea now. You know, the, as you know, the two, the two um, not-for-profit uh, entities uh, have very different focus. Uh, the, uh, the MBT on the social service side of the revitalization efforts and, and New Brunswick Development Corporation, aka DEVCO, on the bricks and mortar side. And while the DEVCO side gets a lot more of the headlines and, and, and uh, attention because of the large scale development that people see, um, equally important is the, is the revitalization side from a social service perspective. Uh, because really all that is done from the bricks and mortar side is intended to revitalize the, the, the people, the quality of life of the people in the city of New Brunswick. Um, so they go hand in hand um, and it's why we do what we do. And, and I guess if I could better understand um, the partnership more like up close, mm -hmm. the city it, clearly, the city is doing many things on the social side, and then we have New Brunswick tomorrow, mm -hmm. and I guess the same thing is really true on the DEFCO end. So, mm -hmm. maybe a little... Well, the, 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 the NBT and yeah. DEVCO purpose is to provide for the gap that exists between what the government can and is doing and what the private sector can and is doing. So, for example, on a development project, uh, if if um, if there's a demand for an office building, whatever the size, um, and the private sector just seems to be not quite willing to pull the trigger because the cost of the investment, the return on their investment, um, um, the, the, the cost of the construction, the process of developing, um, it, it, it's too much for them to really want to pull the trigger and say, let's, let's go ahead. Um, add to that a DEVCO equation where you eliminate the profit margin, they, they, they work to cover their costs, um, they are familiar with the system, they're familiar with the ordinances of the city of New Brunswick, they can serve in any capacity that um, helps to move the project um, down the field and across the goal line. They can be consultants, they can actually serve as the developer. Uh, they understand the financing mechanisms that are available to a municipality either through uh, private sector and or funds that might be available from the state of New Jersey. So they, they are able to package uh, projects and programs that make it more attractive uh, to private sector um, investment. Um, and as a result of that, more projects happen uh, because of that gap, which, quite frankly, government wouldn't be able to do in and of itself. And, and, and government couldn't do because they're strapped or they, they just can't be as flexible to move as fast. I'm just... Well, I mean, just think about it for a second. I mean, you know, it's the old commercial, you know, you've seen it on TV going back a number of years, knocking the door, hi, we're the government, we're here to help. Um, Oftentimes, because the private sector uh, and the government side are not necessarily always on the same page, you know, because the private sector, you know, I want to build this building, but I want to pay the least amount of taxes. And the government side says, but you have to pay you know, the most amount of taxes because that's beneficial to us. Uh, we, want the, we want the building to look like this, uh, the private sector. Well, we think the building should look like that. So you, you, you're at a lot of... Um, well, it doesn't have to be adversarial. There are different perspectives that necessarily have to come into play, you know, as a project unfolds. By having somebody uh, who is familiar with um, both sides of the equation, um, but who has the mission that it has to be in the best interests of the city of New Brunswick, you eliminate, uh, eliminate a, a lot of that back and forth um, that takes place while they're not necessarily negotiations, but in effect they become that, just because there's different points of view. Um, and on the MBT side, um, you know, the city does provide, you know, an awful lot of the social services. I mean, one of the reasons why uh, we, we're a progressive city. I mean, we just, 
we understand that as, a, as an urban center, people are going to migrate here. The more services we provide, the more we attract. Um, and some of our suburban you know, counterparts in the outlining area aren't, aren't equipped nor have the political will or capital uh, to provide the types of services that we provide. So we recognize that that's one of the roles we have to play as an urban center. But notwithstanding all that we do, as government, we're not necessarily experts in these things. You know, we need to, 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 to reach out, to talk to others, to have people guide us and, and how we can better deliver our services, to try and get a handle on, and it's not only the government providing, there's a lot of not-for-profit entities, social service entities in, in New Brunswick that deliver services, to try to eliminate um, uh, the, the duplicity of service you know that the same agencies aren't provide. You know, two different agencies aren't providing the exact same services. With, with particularly in times like now, but in the not-for-profit side, there's never enough money, no matter how good mm -hmm. the economy is, to make sure that we're using the dollars that are available to us as a whole, not just government, but all of us that are in, the, you know, in the delivery of service business, um, that we're using our dollars as effectively and efficiently as we possibly can. MBT serves that role. They, they analyze what it is we do, they communicate um, with the service providers and the residents um, to find out what, where there are gaps, and, and then and work. Like doing something like the, like the annual survey. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. and then work with the government side and the private sector side to, uh, to make sure that those gaps are filled as best we possibly can. All right, so we've spoken some about the public-private mm -hmm. partnership concept. Yep. Maybe if you can speak briefly about some of the entities, maybe J and J, like where mm -hmm. I mean, I your perspective on J and J and, mm -hmm. and, and redevelopment. J and J obviously was the grandfather of, of revitalization uh, in New Brunswick. You know, they were the um, a key component, not only in um, their decision to to build their build and maintain uh, their, their corporate headquarters uh, here, uh, but also the commitment that they provided uh, through um, human resources and to serve on a variety of different boards that were available, uh, the MBTs, the DEVCOs, uh, but also the cultural center, um, the different regional theaters that we have in town, that they were involved in the very fabric of, of what was going on in, in the city. Um, that continues today. Um, although they're not building new buildings, and, and uh, uh, but but there is a, uh, a a regular dialogue that happens with MBT um, and um, you know, with uh, J and J, and they are obviously a critically important corporate resident uh, to to the city of New Brunswick. Um, their presence also, I think, uh, adds to a lot of the dynamic that we have in town and the development of our healthcare industry. You know, the, the hospital's presence here in town is magnificent for us. Uh, the, the presence of UMDNJ and its expansion um, into uh, uh, the Cancer Institute, the Child Health Institute, et cetera, uh, all of that bodes extremely well for, for the city. And I think that it, it, it was more comfortable for the healthcare industry to, to get involved knowing there was a a private sector corporate partner who shared some of the interests um, that um, would provide um, you know, st not staff support but a, a board of directors, board of trustees support, um, and have been through the process. And I guess not, not just any corporation, but yeah. a health. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah, through J and J because of its reputation in the healthcare industry. How about the university? I mean, where are they? In the university is, 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 you know, President McCormick and I share many, many, many conversations. And uh, I think the one vision uh, that is critically important to both of us that we share is the recognition that you can't have a world-class university without a world-class city, and you can't have a world-class city without a world-class university. Uh, so we, we both know that um, the success of our respective uh, entities are tied uh, together. So with that in mind, you know, I, I enjoy working with President McCormick. Um, it, it is, uh, uh, the city is dotted you know, with uh, joint ventures with the university. Uh, the most 
exciting one to me at some time is the, the new bookstore uh, that's going to be at the corner of uh, Somerset Street and Eastern Avenue as a gateway uh, to the old Queens uh, College Avenue campus and tied into our transit village uh, perspective. So it's that type of synergy um, that um, is, is uh, vital to New Brunswick. I'd like to say it's vital to the university um, and we need to do more of it. It's difficult times, you know, the university, you know, with uh, the uh, reduction in funds available, et cetera. Um, the city itself, you know, where we're, you know, while we're holding our own financially, it's more and more difficult to uh, continue to, to pro proceed as quickly as we normally do. But um, I think, like most times, when there's a will, there's a way, and we're, we'll get it done. The city, I assume, makes a payment in lieu of taxes. Is that ever an issue? You mean the university? The university. Sometimes yes, yeah. sometimes no. Um, and, and, and I don't mean to be evasive, and I won't be. Um, but unlike perhaps a lot of other, you know, I used the healthcare industry first you know, as a takeoff line. Um, a lot of urban centers and municipalities didn't. Um, uh, foster an environment um, that was that the healthcare industries or hospitals particularly would find to be receptive. The reason being that okay, the hospital's expanding; it's taking up land that was otherwise irradiable, um, and thus the revenues coming into the city uh, are reduced. I understand that mindset, but hospitals are some generators of, of so many other types of things that create in our case, thousands of jobs. Um, and we saw it as an opportunity for, to attack you know, the, the unemployment that we had in the early 90s, which in 93 or so, shortly after I came into office, was in excess of 13%. We saw the healthcare industry as a way of creating jobs, and not just some jobs, but jobs for all income levels, uh, for all skill levels, so for people who responsible to, 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 to uh, sweep the floors, to people who use the computers, to x-ray technicians, to lab technicians, uh, to administrators, to literally brain surgeons. Um, there's job opportunities for them. And that's the kind of diversity we have in New Brunswick. So it was ideally uh, matched for us. And we were able to reduce our unemployment rate just a year or so. And the university, university is less so than that. Well, to some extent, the, the, the university tends to be a little bit more engaged in its own um, uh, academic world. Um, unlike a hospital which has, which has to do a lot of outreach and a lot of people come in and a lot of people leave, uh, the university is a little bit more self-contained. Um, as a result of that, um, it becomes, uh, the, the jobs don't necessarily generate from within a particular municipality that tend to be more rigid. But having said that, to be specific to your, your, your uh, pilot uh, question, in some instances, depending upon what other benefits there are going to be to the city, um, and, and where we think it's going to be a high job creator, um, we either forego a, a pilot uh, or we negotiate a minimum. Where there's one where we think it's uh, uh, going to be high on the service side for the city, Going to be delivery of a lot of police protection, a fire protection, um, services, public works protection, new roadways, etc. Increase in traffic volume to the city, which has an intangible cost. Yeah, then you'll see a pilot will be negotiated and will be on the, the higher side. Now, does Rockoff? I'm, I'm not aware of this. Does Rockoff Hall, for instance, is that? Is that a Rutgers building that is non-taxable, or is it owned by? The yes, Rutgers so building is owned by New Brunswick Development Corporation, okay, so which in and of itself can be tax exempt if it's I put see. to okay. a if it is put to a tax exempt use. Uh, but in this instance, they do pay a pilot. Will that be true for the Gateway building? Is that going to be uh, a the tax Gateway one? component will have uh, for the Rutgers piece of it um, because there is a profit sector in there with the Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. bookstore. There will be a pilot that's tied to that. Uh, to the actual uh, Rutgers uh, offices that are in there, the University Press, that will not be. 
I have one other facilities question. What about when we're talking about Rutgers? Uh, what about some discussion that's gone on about a downtown arena? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you think would be helpful to the city, or you can't look at it in a vacuum? I mean, saying an arena is good or bad uh -huh. um, in and of itself has no meaning. Uh -huh. You know, there, there has been discussion since the day I became mayor. I think downtown arena. somebody actually said, Jim Hughes, in fact, said the site where the Hyatt is at one time was discussed as an arena site, but that was rejected by J&J &J early on. I think. It was cited that Hyatt was uh, at one point in time the former site of uh, not Memorial Homes, but they actually yes. talked about going over, right. building over Route 18. I have the drawings one. in my office from Peter Eisenman for yes. that. Right. Um, right. And so, you know, but for now close to 20 years, I've been looking at arena proposals. Right. And since the first day, um, there was always a funding gap. Right. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, how's it going to get filled? And I can tell you it's not going to be filled by the city of New Brunswick. Right. So unless and until there's a willing partner in the process to fill that gap, right. um, financially it doesn't make sense. Right. Now, the, the second element of it is arenas are terrific. They generate people. Um, they can be a boom to the economy, but in order for them to be successful, you've got to guarantee that you're going to have 200 nights or days right. of activities. Right. So even if you have 200 days or nights of activities, those activities usually last several hours. So from, from pick a time, it's a 7 o'clock game, mm -hmm. let's say it's a sporting event. Right. Um, so from 5.30 until 11 o'clock, mm -hmm. There's a lot of activity, et cetera. But what happens around that arena right. the rest of the time? So right. there becomes, you know, 165 days a year that there is nothing going on, mm -hmm. uh, and there are, um, you know, 10 to 20 hours a day right. of zero activity, even on the days that things are going on. The building, actually, the theater design, I don't know if you remember this, combined all the student services, so like the registrar mm -hmm. and and everybody was going to be in this building together. It took up like three or four blocks or something. Mm -hmm. So, so are, that it would be something that would constantly building always in use with retail and all of that. There, there, is, there is a lot that can be done to make that happen. But once you start to, you can't forget that the arena itself right. takes up a lot. Right. So now if you build all those ancillary uses around it to create more constant activity, the right. site now has to get bigger. Right. Um, and just looking around New Brunswick, you can see the amount of available mm -hmm. land right. that uh, becomes smaller. And then number two, is the arena the best use mm -hmm. for what might remain? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really have an answer to that because the arena, as I said, in the abstract, Right. It depends what else is tied to it, sure. where the financing is, and, and how are we really going to use it mm -hmm. and the immediately surrounding properties that are tied to it. How are you going to deal with the infrastructure? How are you going to deal with what kind of jobs are we going to create, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So right. all of those need to be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. And in the five to ten cases we reviewed so far, um, it hasn't made sense. If I can get back to the role of the different partners, you sure. mentioned about the shared vision with so mm -hmm. the city and President McCormick. Mm -hmm. Was that true prior no. to the university administration? No. Well, then Blasting, I guess, was there. Blasting was before my time. Mm -hmm. I heard nothing but, but great things mm -hmm. about him. Uh, Dr. Lawrence was. President Lawrence. Yeah, Dr. Lawrence did, did not seem to have a desire to have much interaction with the city. Looking to other partners, so we spoke about J and J. We spoke mm -hmm. about um, the university. Uh, where was the county in all this? County is a great support player. Um, you know, take big investors in in our cultural center. I mean, the state theater is where the state theater is today because of the um, the uh, investment in it made by our our county freeholders. Um, their willingness to support us in many of our regional, uh, our, our recreational um, programs, you know, inf infrastructure improvements to our parks, um, our uh, 
ball fields, our playgrounds, etc. Extremely helpful in our uh, uh, roadway development, improvement of our um, uh, traffic in and around the city. Um, now working with us in green initiatives, um, development of bikeways, etc. in the city. So they are a critically important partner to us. Um, not the least of which in a, uh, is the development of a new um, uh, marina floating dock system at Boyd Park, a contribution from them to help us create positive activity in the uh, river and canal area um, that uh, is going to be critically important to us as Route 18 uh, reconstruction on lines. And if I can continue with the government, sure. state and federal? Um, again, the state has been, a, um, has been there for us um, throughout my uh, my administration. Um, you know, they sometimes more than others when there's more money available, et cetera. But, but I'd like to think that um, both from a state and a federal perspective that uh, those that make the decisions understand that New Brunswick has the ability to get things done and do get things done. So that, and, and we don't stand with our hand out. We come with, with, with particular projects. We, we provide the pro formas that demonstrate what it is we can accomplish, what it is that we're investing of our own, um, because we're, we're not going to have somebody to invest in our projects if we're not going to invest our own money. Um, and then we demonstrate the gap uh, that needs to be filled, either from a programmatic perspective or a financial perspective or a partner perspective that somebody they may know that's out there looking for something uh, that we can, that, that we have the need for. Um, and through that, we've had a great working relationship with the state in getting these types of things done. Um, and it's critically important to have that kind of outreach and, and, and connection. The federal government, again, you know, our legislative leaders have been phenomenal uh, throughout my tenure as mayor. And I guess that, that varied over time, too. You know, well, it, it, not from a legislative perspective. It may have from, the, um, from you know, depending upon who, who is the, the president at the time, using, for example, under the Bush years, you know, the reduction in HUD funds, and the critical need for affordable housing, you know, throughout the state, and the city's great desire to build affordable housing. We, we, we love to build affordable housing because it houses a lot of our people. Um, you know, so during the Bush administration, those monies were becoming less and less and less. But nevertheless, when you're assertive and and uh, there's limited amounts of money, you can still access them, and you can only access them if you have good legislative representatives in, in, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and we've had those. It's hard to say who the neighborhoods are, but uh, with the community in the quotation mm -hmm. where are they in, in, in the redevelopment process? They're all over it. Uh, they're all over it, they're in it. Um, it is why we do what we do. Um, and so, you know, you'll see from the list that I gave you, there's a number of neighborhood revitalization projects that are in, you know, that are um, specifically referred to. There's the development of new housing, there's the rehabilitation of existing housing stock, uh, there's creation of uh, um, uh, warehouses in our industrial section, create jobs. Um, you know, even the stuff that's downtown, well, that's downtown redevelopment. As I said before, that's really creating a place for everybody to come to and feel more comfortable. So you come down to shop, you come down to eat, you come down to work, um, or it provides tens of millions of dollars of revenue to the city on an annual basis. It helps to reduce the cost of living in the city of New Brunswick by providing revenues that otherwise our taxpayers would have to pay. So. Every redevelopment project or revitalization project in the city of New Brunswick benefits our neighborhoods directly or indirectly, regardless of, of, of where it is. And I mentioned before about our unemployment rate. Um, I indicated to you it was 13.4 um, in the early 90s. Well, up until this economic melees, we were able to reduce our unemployment rate to 4.3 percent. You know, when the state was at 4.4 and the county was higher and the country was significantly higher. And for an urban center 
to have an unemployment rate that's lower than his suburban counterparts is virtually unheard of. So the redevelopment process, it's not just creating jobs for somebody else. It's proof positive it's creating jobs for New Brunswick residents. And I guess this respectfully, maybe reflecting some of my academic colleagues. Sure. The, the neighborhoods have an influence in, in much influence in terms of what decisions were made with respect to the redevelopment? They do. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not uncommon um, to attack a revitalization project um, by saying that the neighborhood doesn't have any say or the neighborhood doesn't have any interest. Every redevelopment project has multiple public hearings, and it has multiple public hearings at virtually every level. So, you know, it first you know, goes to the planning board at a public hearing, uh, to, at which the um, planning board recommends to the city council that it consider declaring an area in need of redevelopment or rehabilitation. The city council then holds public hearings as to whether or not it ought to authorize the planning board to study that issue. The planning board then goes back, assuming that the council does it, authorize it, uh, the, the planning board then conducts a public hearing as to whether or not the area is in fact in need of rehabilitation or redevelopment, uh, and the public gets to weigh in on it, and the planning board discusses what a redevelopment plan is, what a revitalization plan is, what a rehabilitation plan is, etc., and what the declaration uh, or, of that area as in need of redevelopment or rehabilitation means. Then, after they make a recommendation, it goes back to the city council to accept, modify, or reject the planning board's decision. And the council does that at a public hearing. Um, then, if they do accept the area as in need of redevelopment or rehabilitation, then there's the creation of a redevelopment plan. The council then sends it back to the planning board to devise the plan, again, at a public meeting. Um, and the recommendation is again made by the planning board, referred back to the city council for acceptance of the redevelopment plan or modification, et cetera, which again is done at public hearings. Um, so, the public has all the time, you know, not less than six to ten opportunities to weigh in at all of these different intervals. In addition to that, notice is given to property owners and tenants within the area um, to encourage, you know, the public input. Um, and so, you know, not only do we go, do we look to solicit public input, we're required by law to do. And I really think it helps us to address, to make the best plan possible. Uh, now, there are some people in a neighborhood who may be, for all the right reasons, opposed to a particular redevelopment plan. And that opinion is to be respected um, and incorporated into at least the thought process. But it is not uncommon for people to use it as a negotiating ploy either. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, oh, you're going to take me, you're going to take my property, Etc., with the idea that at some point in time the uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease, and so that they are going to try to use that as a negotiating tool. But should their property need to be acquired, that um, you know th they'll negotiate a better deal. Um, and I can't tell people that that's not the way to do it, that's the way they think it works. Um, but we have done redevelopment projects uh, where, through the process, people have said. We don't think it's a good idea for this to be incorporated into it. We've thought about it and we've carved sections out where we thought it would be detrimental to the project as a whole or, quite frankly, unnecessary for the success of the project and that the community um, thought that it was going to be a disservice to them. Your perspective on uh, the arts and redevelopment in New Brunswick? Critically important. It's, I mean, first and foremost, it, it it's creates the heart and the soul of a, uh, of, a uh, of a city. Um, you know, it, 
creates a vibrancy, it creates a, a forum for expression, um, it's a place for people to gather and socialize, um, it just adds um, to uh, what a city is all about. Uh, so from that perspective, it's critically important, but economically, it's also from a practical business sense. You know, most people who go to the theater are going to spend some time uh, in the city. They're going to uh, um, they're going to go to a restaurant. They're going to go shop. Um, they're going to do something in addition to go to the theater. They're going to create an activity in in the immediate area that uh, people say, "Wow, there's things happening there. We need to go there and see what's going on." Uh, it creates a vibrant hub uh, for for um, activity. Um, and business, and of course, you know, for you know, the theaters employ people, um, the restaurants that people go to employ people, uh, and they are job creators. Um, and you know, the the number uh, of that for every ticket price, you know, a dollar that somebody spends for a ticket, the the compounding factor of that an investment elsewhere in the community is several fold. Um, so, investment in the arts is, is a good investment. Um, I guess you indirectly alluded to the restaurants. Mm -hmm. We can speak about that and, and its role in terms of the revitalization of the city. Um, I, we are fortunate that we've got a lot of really terrific restaurants. So, uh, that in and of itself puts New Brunswick on the map in the state of New Jersey and beyond. Uh, but it's also, uh, it's not just the upscale restaurants, it's the different variety and types of restaurants we have, not only in the immediate downtown area, but in some of our neighborhoods. Um, uh, a lot of the ethnic uh, eateries and restaurants that we have that create a certain atmosphere in the city that, uh, uh, quite frankly, isn't easily duplicated, if at all, elsewhere. Uh, so, again, gathering places where people can get together. That's what cities are all about. If somebody doesn't want to get together with somebody, they can stay, you know, home and they can watch television or do whatever it is they do by themselves. But um, if you want to get out and meet people, the restaurants, um, uh, the taverns, the pubs, uh, the theaters, um, they're all terrific gathering places for people to, to share ideas and good fellowship. It can't be bad. How, how transferable do you think what has happened in the Brunswick can, can be applied to other urban areas? Uh, or is it just a set of unique people and factors, or is there well, it, a model? It's, 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 it's both. I mean, you could set the people who started the revitalization process or had the vision and the foresight that they had some 30 years ago plus um, set up these entities um, and um, understood the role of the private sector, the government sector, etc. But if the right people aren't in place in any of these entities, or quite frankly in all of the entities, um, then all the systematic or programmatic changes that are put into place to try and duplicate a New Brunswick model aren't going to be worth anything. Um, it really create it really requires the individual attention um, and the recognition of one's own individual responsibility to get things done. So if you know if the conversation if I'm talking notwithstanding how good or bad you know, let's assume for discussion's sake I'm asking you to go out on a limb here that I'm a good man. No matter how good I am, if I'm trying to get a healthcare initiative done, and I'm trying to work with the hospital, either of the two hospitals, and the leadership of the two hospitals couldn't care less what I have to say, where am I going? Um, it doesn't matter how good my ideas are. If I can't get somebody to come along, then, then it's doomed to failure. By the same token, using the same principles involved, the hospital has a great initiative but they have no response from the governmental side that says, eh, I don't care what you guys want to do. Um, you're off on your own. You guys go do what you have to do, and we'll worry about what we have. My plate is full. 
um, it's not going to happen. Do you? It, 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 it's the idea of putting people around a table who, who share a common vision, not necessarily on individual subject matters, but as an overall goal uh, and a willingness to try and play a role in any project that they can that advances it, so long as it s serves a purpose for their respective constituencies, um, that has been the success of Nebrantuk. So the model of the MBTs, the DEVCOs, et cetera, I think are helpful, but I don't know that they're absolutely necessary if you have the right people involved. Uh, I've been very fortunate, you know, in every one of the entities that uh, are critically important uh, to the continued success of the revitalization efforts. Um, we've had people who, who have common interests and goals and, and a willingness to work together to get it done. Do you think the city size has contributed some to the, the progress that has been made? Yeah. You know, you're sure. 40,000 and not 400,000. Yeah, we're, we're, we're 50,000. We're, we're proud of that extra 10,000. We've been 40,000 for decades and decades and decades. Um, and in the last census, up a little over 48,000, which makes us the fastest growing urban center in the state. Um, and that number now exceeds 50. But of course, the 2010 census will, will determine that. But uh, yeah, we're more manageable. Um, you know, 50,000 is, uh, we're more manageable, but we also have all of the issues confronting us that the 200, the 400, and the 1 million population cities have. So because we're kind of eclectic like that, um, you know, but, but we can, as a mid-sized city or a smaller city, you know, depending upon what your definition is, I, I think we're more manageable as a result of that. And I would think also the fortuitous location of the county seat, Rutgers. Well, that, that. that makes it easier, um, but by the same token, all of the things that we have today were things we had or that we were in the 60s and the early 70s when we were um, at the bottom of the barrel. So it's not a question of what you have, it's a question of can you take advantage of what you have. And just, you know, you could, you could look at urban centers throughout the state of New Jersey um, who have, you know, who are on the beach, you know, on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, who are on the Hudson River, who are directly across from New York City, um, you know, and, and they're struggling. Um, so, so what I'm hearing is this importance of the people around the table cooperating is being very, very key, and the other factors may be contributing, but not singularly important. Right. And having a um, uh, having a a community that's invested in the process, you know. So no redevelopment or revitalization happens easily. You know, there, there there's you know from a, from a um, citizenry perspective. You know, there's the fear of the unknown, the lack of trust, the credibility that the governing body may have, in trying to move something forward, etc. Um, but I think. And I, and I would suggest it was more difficult um, in the years before me um, because it was new. Um, but um, I think we've established a credibility that we do what we say. You know, we're, we're not a gentrification type of program. We're not kicking people out. We're not looking to move people or businesses out of the city. That we're all in this together. And as a result of that, I think the citizenry of New Brunswick um, becomes more supportive and actually look forward to the advancement of, of, of new projects, new ideas, um, new housing, etc., and, and sometimes demand it. With the benefit of hindsight, I'm going to have to leave in sure. a minute, but then for theory. Yep. With the benefit of hindsight, Mm -hmm. Because we always have 20, 20 sure. hindsight. Things that, you know, if you had your druthers, you know, could have been done differently, should have done. And I, I don't say that, no, I, I, I don't say that because everything is perfect. But one thing that I, I make sure of, we do as an administration, 
um, is we gather all of the best information we possibly can. We weigh all the options, um, and based upon the information and the options we have, we make a decision. Um, nothing's rash. Um, nothing is forged ahead just because we need to do something. Um, so, as a result of that, the projects we've done were the best that they could possibly be, given the circumstances we've had. Um, and, in, uh, uh, and, you know, the, the idea is to continue to build upon each of those. We used the Farron deck as an example. I mentioned it before. It's one of the, the early ones that was done before my time. You know, would I have done that differently today than I did then? You know, or then it was done then. Um, yeah, the answer is yes, and we look to redevelop that site today. But at the time, that was progress. That was the best the city could hope for, to, to get that glimmer of hope of that one person coming by to have a sandwich at the corner store or grab a cup of coffee as they were getting on the train. But now, that site is really underutilized. Um, and it, it is because of our designation as a transit hub, a village center, all of these other types of things, it has become the destination. So that project, if done today, I would do differently. But then, that was the best anybody could look for. Uh, and I think that's the way you've got to look at urban development. What about the fact that you lived here yeah, since... David, good to see you. Sure, right. Stay well. Good luck with this. Yeah, yeah, I'll just be a few more minutes. The fact that you grew up here, uh, do you have any memory, fond memories of historic buildings that are now gone? Or, you know, because there was that issue down in the Hiram District, you know? Uh, most of the properties I remember in the Hiram District were, were junk. Um, as a kid growing up, there was an area that, quite frankly, I wouldn't be anxious to visit on a frequent basis all the time, particularly as it became, you know, into the late 60s and, and early 70s. Um, you know, historical buildings are, 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 are critically important. But by the same token, those historical buildings have to be maintained. Right. Um, and unfortunately, I think uh, for decades and decades and perhaps centuries, depending upon the particular building, um, people allowed, and when I say people, that means all of us, um, allowed buildings to deteriorate so much that the historical significance of it becomes somewhat remote. Mm -hmm. um, either because somebody renovated the building and, and, and destroyed the historical character of the building, or the place was in such danger of collapse and disrepair that it no longer um, has any semblance to what it once was. Mm -hmm. So while I don't have any great first-hand knowledge uh, of the high market area, using that as an example, I, I don't have any really great fond memories of a particular structure that, oh boy, I wish that was here today, it would be so much better. Uh, but, but having kept some of the buildings in the Hiram Square area, um, like Christ Church, right. uh, like the, uh, the First Reformed right. uh, Church, and like Polyzetic uh, Synagogue, right. uh, and the investment of uh, government dollars into the restoration and maintenance of those buildings, by you know, incorporating into Kilmer Square mm -hmm. some of the older buildings, et cetera, that are into there. Those that were salvageable and worth saving were. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that I think that's what it's about. You've got to come up with the perfect blend. And quite frankly, if the private sector it, it is so desirous of maintaining, again, using the Harlem Square mm -hmm. area, um, if it was that important, efforts should have been taken over the decades before that to do something about it. And if we only become concerned about historical buildings when somebody's going to take it away, then how really interested are we in those? Uh, and that's why, you know, with our now historical uh, building you know, uh, restorations and maintaining, we designate buildings in the city. We identify those that are of interest and, and, and worth concern. We've invested money, uh, city dollars, in the restoration of these types of things to preserve them, and that's in large part because people have expressed interest in maintaining them.
Um, just one thing I wanted to go back to <clears throat> from what we've heard from people. I guess John Eldridge was the one who first <clears throat> made me aware of this, that I guess you could say some of the redevelopment really dated back to a meeting that LBJ held with CEOs of major firms and cities where he was worried about unemployment causing riots, I guess, or okay. whatever. So back in 1968, um, it must have then been Jim Burke, maybe, or it was Richard Sellers. Uh, Dick Whoever. Sellers was before Jim Burke. Okay, I, mean, so I won't <laughs> say it's him at 67, but um, it wouldn't have been Or Burke. his predecessor, yeah. maybe, yeah. who went to this meeting that LBJ held and came back. And then, I guess it was Richard Sellers, because he was the one who then put John Heldrich in charge mm -hmm. of dealing with, you know, underemployment. What can we do to, you know, generate more jobs in the city? Mm -hmm which was sort of, you know, I guess the beginning of his thinking of what else can we do in the city, going to Hartford, you know, getting interested in the Rouse Corporation coming in and American cities doing this plan. So, you know, looking back on that and thinking about, you know, John Heldrich's own leadership that yeah. he provided here, do you feel that, you know, if LBJ were here today, he would actually say that what happened was something that he maybe envisioned with the need to do something in cities to, to bring up employment and, and to keep people. I, I don't know what LBJ would say because I wasn't part of that conversation, right. but um, whoever uh, were the people behind the thought process and the development um, of the New Brunswick model, mm -hmm. I think could only take a look at where we are today and say, uh, it worked, and what are we going to do to make it better? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, you know, New Brunswick has done stuff that nobody else has done, um, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, it continues to be hard, uh, but so long as there are committed people like John Eldridge, mm -hmm. like Dick Sellers, like John Lynch, uh, like all of those people who were involved in the initial days. Um, and like Chris Palladino and Glenn Patterson mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. um, you know, these pro, you know, New Brunswick will continue to to get better. It'll never be done. Right. You know, the the, the canvas always needs something mm -hmm. else to be mm -hmm. placed on it. But uh, 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 it, it, there's always room for progress, and, and as long as we have people who are willing and, and able to do it, you know, we'll continue to do that. Were there elements to the original first plan that haven't yet been completed? I don't know. I don't think there were specific pieces of it, you know, to do this here. Right. Um, but I think it was more generic and, and what the ultimate goals mm -hmm. were. The identification of development and downtown development right. in the uh, corridor, but without specifics. And uh, I would dare say that, uh, that uh, the generic goals that were established have been, have been met. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have to turn off all of these recording devices. I guess the only thing I, other thing I didn't ask was were there other people you would suggest are vital to this interview process? We've interviewed. Well, what, what do you actually? I mean, I saw the outline. Right. You know, so, based upon the outline, you've got the people who I think um, you need. The only person I would have suggested was Glenn Patterson. But I understand yes, David's been trying to contact him. I understand him. that you've right. already got him on your you list. You know, Eric Krebs so. gave us, I mean, we did interview Eric Krebs. It was interesting, his telling us back in the late 60s, mm -hmm. the theaters, he started along East Penn Avenue. Yep. And, then, yep. um, and he suggested one or two other people who were key in the arts development. Um, you know, we interviewed Andy Baglevo sure. yesterday. He He's got a great history. Yeah. Yes, yeah. great. He's, and he's still able to remember a lot yeah. about it. Um, I guess the only other thing that we're doing with this project is uh, collecting documents. We've talked with um, John, in fact, about all the papers that he has and offered to help him in organizing them and maybe putting them in the Rutgers, New Jersey archives. I was going to say there might be some some value to that because he's ever, I, I meet with him regularly mm -hmm. and uh, he is still um, of great help to me. Right. 
but he's always pulling out these records I know. of something. He, and, he and had it some, when we were uh, there. He had a file. He yeah. had diagrams of you know the mantra of uh, J sure. and J sure. and right. Sure. Um, so I would think this. But if you need documents from us, you know I can get Glenn to to start okay. to dig stuff out. I'm not sure what you would need. Uh, I mean, the, right. there's planning projects, there's uh, uh, redevelopment plans. Well, just so you, do you have your own archives here on the, oops, on the redevelopment process, or no? Uh, what they we would, would be have, the New Brunswick Library. Well, again, it depends specifically what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to see, for example, the read. They would not all fall into a file that's called redevelopment. Right. Um, there would be a file on each redevelopment project. I see. Uh, and there would be the plan, which mm -hmm. is a written document. Right. There would be the plan, which is a, a map or a sketch right. or a blueprint. Right. Um, and uh, there would be resolutions and or ordinances right. of action taken by you know, the city council or the planning board. Or the so they're board. all kept here then? They're all kept. Um, Glenn would have all of those. Okay. Uh, ordinances and resolutions the right. city clerk would have. Right. Um, now, I would think most of the ones we're talking about that go back 30 or so years are probably still somewhere within the city government property. Okay. Uh, I couldn't tell you what whether or not any of them are archived. If they're archived, they're still accessible. The library yeah. probably wouldn't have, right. they would have newspaper articles and some things, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think they would, they would be an exhaustive um, inventory of things. Well, Tom Frisciano, who's the university archivist, is interested in you know organizing the documents, at least that were, we may come across, whether it's John Heldrich or Andy Bagalivo's firm or whatever. So at some point, you know, if you want to consider the city's documents, if you don't have any other archival method here, okay. you know, that that's possibly something the university can also okay. do for the city. Sure. All right. So. Terrific. Okay. Um, I will uh, speak to Mr. Lynch. Okay. and. Uh, um, see what uh, what he can arrange. Mr. Lynch was my son's mentor, and right. Andrew work Andrew books him. I don't know if you knew him. He worked for a while for um, campaign firm. Okay. Rachel, can't remember her last name. They're located over in Kilmer Square, but they run campaigns of Democratic okay. candidates. Okay, sure, I know Rachel. Um, he worked for her for about two years. He just finished. He went to Texas, graduated this spring from the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Okay, and what's his last name? Hooksama. Hooksama. Andrew okay. Hooksama. He worked Don't there know. with Patrick. I okay. can't remember Patrick's last name, but they both worked with Rachel. Okay. So, but he's not coming back to New Jersey. He, entered, he had an interview with Adam Zellner. Okay, sure. Um, but decided he's going to work for the Environmental Quality Commission in Texas. Okay. For the time being. He likes Texas. He likes Texas, and, uh, you know, he's got a good job there where he interned, so. Good for him. And he